I wanted to take you back to when you were growing up to give context to just how dangerous a place South Africa was yeah. back then. Talk about going to the anti-apartheid uh, concert. Americans don't understand that the rest of the world is not like America. You know, we have a lot of very difficult things happening in the world today, and um, and, and I, I feel empathy for all of those situations, just like the average American. But but America is just not the rest of the world. It's just not. So so during the '80s was the fall of the apartheid, and it was very complicated because there are 27 tribes, black tribes. There are really two white tribes, as Afrikaans and English, and they hate each other more than the black on white situation. Uh, the there were the history of the, the fighting between the Dutch and the English just it makes most wars look tame and then the, the black tribes all hated each other for their hundreds of thousands of years of history and so the the, the level of violence was just extraordinary uh, walking home from school you in fear all the time mostly of white people not of black people and uh, that's just the nature of the day and we would go to these anti-apartheid rallies and, and concerts. It was very much, we were part of that movement that was, uh, it, was a, it was a social movement, not just, not just political. We take these trains, that were, which were very dangerous. There were trains that, that, there were a lot of train car massacres where it was black on black violence where they would, they would just get on the train and just start killing people with machine guns. And that was just kind of part of the day. It was such a, it's messed up to think I used to live in that way and just kind of accept it. But, I remember getting to this concert and the, the, the train doors open and there's two black guys and there's one black guy, and I just caught the end of the fight, he takes a knife and stabs it into the side of this guy's head, like right, like right there. And this guy just drops dead, boom. And you're just, you're on the train, you've got a whole bunch of people behind you want to get off the train, but you've just got this dead guy in front of you. And you're like, oh shit. And it's just the pool of blood just starts pooling all over the ground. And you just, as a kid, I'm 16 years old, and just like, oh. so I, I just take a step in the pool of blood because you can't avoid it. Uh, and I remember for like about 100 paces, just the stickiness of one, 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 one foot, like one sneaker, just, you know, and I just like, you just, you just move on. You know, you just can't, you can't allow yourself to process what just happened. It's, you just move on, you just, you just, but I, the, the one thing I'll never forget is that stickiness of the blood on my sneaker. I'll never forget that. Elon getting severely beaten up at school and then the subsequent berating by your dad. Um, what about that makes it such a painful memory for you even today? Yeah, that was, that was so brutal. Um, so back to the white on white violence. So this was white people attacking white people. Um, uh, I was sitting next to Elon, and these guys come up to him, four or five guys, uh, and they just start just beating him and beating him senseless with their fists. There's nothing I can do to help. I just have to sit and watch this. Um, they, the, I might have, I might have done something. I can't remember. Like, you're just in this like trance of what what's going on, and they they had the intention to beat him to death. And it was just, uh, it was just awful. It was just the most uh, awful thing to witness. Um, my brother's face was unrecognizable. Like it just wasn't, it was just a swollen lumps of someone that had been almost beaten to death. And uh, yeah, that's, that's just, uh, that's just South Africa in the 80s, man. It's just so brutal. I can tell even watching you talk about it now, it still so uh, affects hard, yeah. you. Um, why? I mean, I love my brother. I think um, that one stays with me because you feel it's a feeling of total powerlessness while someone you love is is just literally being beaten to death and just you're just powerless. I think that that uh, that, 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 that that was that was still one of the hardest things I've ever experienced. I wanted to ask you briefly about your dad. I wonder if not for him, do you think you would have still had as much success as you ended up having in life? You know, I think there are ways to teach your kids to, to work hard 
take risks without torturing torturing them. I mean, we lived in torture. It was it was a emotional, psychological torture. Because he would make you stand there for two to three hours yeah, and like just scream like at you. It was insane. It was, and not just that, he would make up things that were not real. And then you'd spend three hours listening and, you, and then you'd, you'd sort of look, maybe, maybe, maybe he's right, maybe that is true. So it was a psychological torture. I don't know how else to say it. I, I think that um, what it definitely did do was give me and my brothers this absolute fear of going back, you know, so. How so? Like if we, I remember even talking in the, when I was in my early 20s with my brother, we were at, at dinner, we were, business might fail, you know, we're like, this just, you know, one of those days where things are just done. And we, we just, yeah, we're not going back. So we have no choice but to keep going, keep trying. To what extent uh, did it ever concern you having gone through that, that at some point in life you could develop some of those same traits yourself? There's sort of nature versus nurture, right? I think that the parts that are nature, I can't, I can't fix that. Um, and uh, that being said, as I've gotten older, I've learned how to nurture myself, and my wife has also really helped me to have a relationship with my kids that's very different. It's, in fact, it's completely different to what I, what my my parents had with me, and it's it has a more deeper emotional connection, and and at the same time, I. I believe my kids are going to work very hard to do pretty amazing things and take risks. There's this concept of secure attachment and this concept of um, chaotic attachment, I think is the term. And I had this kind of chaotic attachment with my dad, which was a lot of love and then here's some insanity. And then you just you just totally shake it up. Oh no no, and there's a lot of love, and then this is insanity. And and that insanity was what? It, it, it was, was just violence like, at times. No, it was never okay. physical violence. He never. It was never physical. It was just. Uh, but it was very violent in verbal ways. It was a verbal abuse. Uh, but it was hours and hours. It wasn't like, oh, I remember this one time you said something. No, it was just constant. Um, con or it was absolute love, and you just, just don't know what to expect. So I think what I've been able to do with my kids, which I have had to work on, is this concept of secure attachment. Where like, yeah, I think you might be doing something that is, I don't agree with. All right, I still love you. I'm, I'm here for you, but I'm going to speak very openly about about that. And I think that's a training that I've I've had over the years, and it's I think it's going to work out pretty well for my kids as a result. I hope they, you never know. They're, they're going to get therapy for something. I'm there. I'm not trying to be perfect. That's like that's for the birds. Could you ever envision a day where that relationship's able to be repaired? It really doesn't uh, occur to me. You know, I think that uh, I've left that one in the past. Your mom was saying it was about '67 that uh, stuff started to take off for her modeling um, because yeah. you know you guys are having success. Her social media is exploding. Um, what was that like for you to watch for her? I love it. You know, my mom is just this incredible energy. She's a survivor. I mean, she had to deal with my dad for many years, and she, she escaped from the house. I mean, there was no, so divorce wasn't even legal in South Africa. So 19, I can't remember the year, but 1979 or something, the day it became legal, she filed the papers and escaped from the house at midnight with us in the back seat. Like, it's like that's the level of abusive household we were living in. It was not, he would have physically prevented her from, from leaving. Um, and I think in the case of my mom, he did actually get physical, but in our case, less so. So that's her survival story. And then she had been a model as part-time and so then she had to figure out how to, how to make money. So she went and studied uh, dietetics, she's very, very science-minded. She got a master's in dietetics. We lived in these little apartments. We we're just getting by. And then occasionally she would get some of these modeling gigs that would add a few hundred dollars here or there. In different, in different currency, but um, the one year after the other, one decade after the other, she would keep going, and she loved it. Um, it was a joy for her, and going out to these auditions where you are rejected all the time, people think modeling is easy, it is hard. It is constant work to get people to care. And I think what happened when, was, when she was 67, it wasn't actually that she became this well-known model. She was actually a pretty well-known model before that. It's that when you get to supermodel status, 
you no longer do auditions. She was like, oh my goodness, people just call me and they, they want me to do something. And so that happened when she was 67. Can you believe that? Where after literally what, 50 years, because she started when she was 16, so just over 50 years of hustling and working on it, and because she loves it, all of a sudden she's an over, overnight success. And um, uh, it was so beautiful to watch. I'm so proud of her. Uh, watching her, you know, see, I'll see her billboards in Times Square or uh, see her in, a, in the airports and with some of these, uh, you know, other supermodels that are, you know, also world famous. Just so surreal, you know, and, and so I'm so proud of her. And truly is an inspirational story for somebody to stick with it for that long yeah. in spite of everything she'd been through. Absolutely. To achieve her dreams. And, yeah. and, and it truly, she lived a life of survival. And she has a book, uh, Woman Makes a Plan, where she just, every step of the way, she makes a plan, but she keeps doing what she loves. She doesn't have some, that sort of gen gene where, oh, I want to retire someday. She loves working. And so to be working and be appreciated, and now she's traveling the world, doing all these incredible things, and being flown first class there and here. And there. She still lives the world world. Like, this could end at, any, end at any moment, so I'm just going to enjoy every day. And uh, it's just great. It's so cool. Tell about the, the firecrackers in the cigarettes. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, so Tosca, my brother and I, we were, my mom was divorced and um, we, we'd moved to Durban, which is a town in, in, on the coast of South Africa. And she was dating this guy that we did not like at all. And it turned out very b badly for my mom and that he was dating someone else, cheating on her. And it was, it was, it was, we, we, we knew it instinctively that this was wrong for my mom. Because he had some of the same abuse traits as your He was dad, different. Right? He, was, he was just an ass. Okay. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on camera. <laughs> <I'm trying>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was just kind of douchey. And I was like, our mom deserves better than and, this right, guy. Right, you guys yeah. want what's best for <laughs> yeah, your mom. Right, yeah. right. And so, he, and he was a smoker and we were, we were a pretty hardcore non-smoking household. No one ever smoked or anything. And to this day, it never, never really smoked. And um, uh, we just thought it would be really funny to put uh, these little put these little uh, fireworks inside of a cigarette, and uh, and it blows the cigarette <laughs> apart. It's not really it's not safe. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely not that safe. Yeah. <laughs> but we didn't care about that. And so um, uh, well, that was that was actually a, one of our proud moments. I think I was probably seven years old and. We, were, we watched it happen. We watched him get so mad and storm out of the house. And we were like, that's great. <laughs> Explain to me how it worked where your mom's on holiday and while she's gone, your sister sells her house and all her belongings. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's, my, that's my sister. You know, we we're definitely a ramb rambunctious uh, group. Um, so Tosca is... Uh, a very determined person. She's the CEO of a, an amazing uh, movie company. So I'm at that point 18 and I'm in my last year of high school, ready to go to Canada afterwards. And Tosca's 16, she, so she's facing this idea of being stuck in South Africa for another two years to finish high school or whatever reason. And so uh, my sister in, her, in an entrepreneurial spirit reaches out to, uh, you know, there'd been some discussions already at the time, but reaches out to the folks that, she, that she'd been talking to. And before my mom got back, uh, my sister had agreed to terms. You know, no, no email in those days either, right? So it's like really hard to communicate back yeah. and forth. Uh, agreed to terms, had uh, sold, I mean, my mom had to sign, of course, but had essentially sold the house and had organized all the movers, packed up all the furniture. And um, my mom just really didn't have a choice when she got back. Okay, we're moving to Canada. And, and nobody said to your sister at any point during that, you might want to wait till your mom gets home before. No, we were like, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> and, and, and then when I was talking to your mom yesterday on the phone, she's like, yeah, I was fine with it. When yeah, I know. I think we were all like, yeah, that sounds like the right thing to do. <laughs> Versus having waited uh, probably a, a couple of years. We grew up as a, a family that didn't really uh, understand rules that much like for example when I say rules I mean more like hey you should probably wait for your mom to come back that's already a rule but it's societal guidelines to say that we had this idea which was a really good idea although I'm glad we didn't do it my brother and my two cousins and I we, we were working on this idea of a video arcade we're like of course we, we found the location we found a lease and uh, we, uh, we 
we negotiated for the arcade games and I go to the city here, we just need you guys to sign this stamp that we can, we can have a business. And they look at me like, uh, where, where are your, where's your parents? And I said, oh, no, um, my parents aren't involved. They're like, oh, well, we need an adult to sign. Someone over the age of 18 has to sign this. So I go back to uh, my, my cousins and my brother. Like, we need someone to sign this that's older than us, that's 18. And of course, my dad was like, no, you guys were in high school. You're not, you're yeah. not going to run a video arcade game. Uh, Would have only fed, uh, <laughs> further fed a lifetime addiction to video games <laughs> yeah, you guys right, have, right? Exactly, exactly. It would have been a great business, but I think if we had done that, we would have... We would have dropped out of high school. Uh, name as many jack-in-the-box menu items as you can remember. <laughs> um, chicken fajita pita. That was uh, my go-to. Um, they have a sourdough uh, melted cheeseburger, which is really when you want to when you want to like treat yourself. Um, they uh, I'll never forget. They have these weird milkshakes where. Uh, there was like an Oreo cookie milkshakes. Just the absolute uh, worst food, given what I've learned over my years. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they served a need 24 hours a day and cheap as dirt. It was funny I, when I was reading that, given uh, obviously all the success you've had in the food space, I'm like, I'm surprised he's not a diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, college pro painters. Oh, yeah. Um, explain why you said that, like, the most difficult, uh, like labor-intensive work you've ever done? Yeah, so the, the College Pro Painters was a, was a franchise where you, you, you're 18 or 19 years old, uh, 20 years old, and you join and you paint over the summer. And um, I had absolutely no intention of doing something like that. I, in high school, was very excited about Wall Street. And so I went to business school as an undergrad, and I, uh, one of the things my brother and I would do, we'd, we'd cold call people that we thought were interesting. We'd read the newspaper and then challenge each other to cold call. So I, I cold called this one guy who was head of a bank, one of the biggest banks, and uh, managed to get a summer job there. My first summer, you know, an immigrant, not supposed to get these kind of jobs if you don't have connections, but we, we figured it out. So I, I got this and, job. And how, how did you figure it out? You're just calling them up, asking them for lunch, and then asking them for a job. And uh, you learn young to, to do that sort of stuff. We, we, we did, and, and uh, I got the job. It was, it was about as exciting of a job as you can imagine. It was like the strategic planning division of the bank, the whole thing, and I was absolutely bored to tears. I was like, I cannot believe that this is what I had obsessed over. I learned very quickly that's not what I wanted, but then I was like, now what do I do? And there was this uh, ad or, or these, this booth to go sign up for a, a painting franchise, house painting. And I, I uh, thought to myself, well, I, I want to be an entrepreneur. I think after, if I look at my family, my, all, of my, all of my family, all entrepreneurs, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur. But it was actually the most terrifying thing to, to accept. How so? Be because everyone in my family is an entrepreneur. And so what if I'm not? And I, I, I remember really struggling and going, oh my God, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not cut out for this. And it was, it was one of the most uh, fearful times of my life in those days. Um, and I was coming close to failing. And I had this kind of uh, fake confidence, like, oh no, it's gonna be great, I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out. But actually inside I was terrified. I managed to pull a few rabbits out of the hat and had a successful summer, and then I became Rookie Manager of the Year, which was like, okay, all right, I can do this. Oh my God, so I was, that, it was one of the hardest, but also one of the proudest moments of my life. Um, I did it the, again the next summer, and then I was like, wait a minute, I don't want to be in the house painting business. I just, as soon as the fear of not succeeding went away, I needed more to life than just the, I, I was flush with cash as a kid. Um, you know, made $100,000 in a summer. Like, that's in the 90s. Yeah. You know, and you're like, I'm just gonna buy that car and I'm gonna buy that stereo and blah, 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 blah. By the end of the summer, I had no money, but I definitely <laughs> knew how to spend it, but it gave me no, no, no sort of joy in my soul. So that's when I started to talk with my brother. We were graduating at the same time, even though he's a little older than me. And let's go do an internet company together and I was like, okay, I think that will bring me more meaning than what I had experienced. And backing up momentarily, the, that skill set of 
you know, cold calling somebody from the newspaper or door knocking. Uh, in what ways do you think that benefited you? Honestly, I think it's, if I can give advice to any young person, is just try to meet as many people that you respect as possible. Be brave. Uh, people reach out to me all the time and they know, they know that, well, I would say they know this, they, they, I, I try to respond to, to everyone. I'm not always able to meet people, but, but the, the, it's so uncommon how many times people get a thoughtful outreach from someone. This worked when we were students. As soon as we were not students, it was, actually we didn't get the same reception. It was more like, okay, they're here to help. They were, they were truly worth giving back. So I, I, I would say um, it's one of the greatest lessons to learn if you're 18 or 19 or 20 and, and you're in, in school, read the newspaper, genuinely find someone you're interested in meeting, call them up, don't use email, don't use uh, uh, texting or whatever. If you got the old fashioned phone, it still works and ask them out to lunch and, and take them to lunch, see what happens. You remember what the uh, office sleep YMCA schedule sure. was for you back then? Well, that was, uh, we were, that was in Palo Alto and then we were building Zip2, which was mm -hmm. uh, an incredible technology company. We were building maps in the door-to-door -door directions for the internet. We figured out a business model where we would onboard newspapers that had restaurant guides and so forth and, and Real estate listings, so it was a the first to do it. First to do it, yeah, yeah. absolutely, totally. And we were actually my brother and I were the first two humans to see door-to-door -door directions on the internet. And now it's a, a thing we all use ten times a day. It was just like when we first saw it, we we're like, "This is." It took sixty seconds to to get get an answer back, but we we're like, "This is incredible." We didn't have any money for. Well, I mean, we had money, but we needed it for, for, for buying computer servers or we needed it for food. And so the idea of spending money on an apartment as well was like, no, 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 we were asleep in the office. Um, I grew up cooking, so for me, I also liked to cook, but I had like a little tiny little stove top and a mini fridge. It was, uh, it worked, but you gotta get the kind of smell out of the office because when our employees would come in, we didn't want them to think they were, we, we, sleep, we were sleeping in the office. And, um, I mean, even though those were hard days, actually, I, I don't recall them as hard. It was very exciting days. What do you remember from that Toronto Star president meeting? Yeah, so that was uh, amazing. So I was working, uh, we were working on Zip2. I was still in Toronto at the time. Um, my brother was in uh, Silicon Valley. This is 1995, and they, they had a multi-billion dollar business with their Yellow Pages. And we're sitting them, talking them through the internet and talking him through how this will be the yellow pages of the future. And um, uh, he literally picked up this yellow pages. It was this thick. You could see how much, how much money they make on something that thick. And he picked it up and he threw it at me. And he said, do you ever think you're going to replace this? And I was in such shock. First of all, why did he throw the book at me? Like that, that, it wasn't very physical, but it was still like really intense. But the first thing that occurred to me was not uh, the, the, not an answer, not, 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 not a, not, oh my goodness, why did you throw a book at me? It was more like, oh, he doesn't realize he, he's already dead. It was an actual like, this guy runs a multi-billion dollar business that is already dead. And he doesn't realize that. And two years later, we ended up onboarding the Toronto Star onto the internet. And uh, we ended up actually having a good relationship uh, later. Um, and it, and he, was, he was apologetic. He was like, uh, you're right. You almost didn't make it to an investor pitch meeting once, yeah, right? You that's uh, right. Uh, got stopped at the border. So this, I love my mom very much. And she asked me desperately to go fix her computer. And I, this is how much I love her. I flew from... Palo Alto to Toronto to, to literally be her IT person. <laughs> and it was January of, of 1996, flew out, fixed her computer, come back to the, the airport, and the, you know, the immigration system in America is really messed up, even though we were building something very exciting, even though we were uh, courted by, by several investors, I still didn't have a proper visa. And, um, and so I got to the border and they, they looked at me, I was 
uh, I probably dressed too well. I should have dressed like a tourist or something. And they made me take my luggage apart and look at all my, all my um, stuff. And inside were investor decks and, and even a business card that showed my address there. And, and they're like, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't do that. And uh, I was like, okay, I don't really know what to do because I've got this critical meeting the next morning. It was that was for everything. I mean, that was for was, everything. It was, was it was it was our yeah. it was the investor we wanted. Yeah. So I call my friend who is a friend of mine, Jamie, and he I say, Would you mind picking me up and driving me across the border? So he picks me up, drive drive to the border, say, Do we tell do we tell the border guys we're gonna go see the David Letterman show? And they were like, Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> we get to, I get to the Buffalo airport, fly to uh, San Francisco wake up early the next morning, we take the, we take the bus, because none of our cars works, we take the bus to our uh, venture partnership meeting, we have a successful meeting, um, and uh, you know, they, they were, like, we're negotiating and getting the whole thing done, the whole deal kind of happens that day, and at the end of the day, we say we have to leave because we've got to catch the, catch the bus, and they're like, what do you mean you have to catch the bus? And I said, yeah, and they said, okay, hold on, okay. We need to get these guys cars. So they actually gave us like a $30,000 budget each <laughs> to buy a car. We we're like, these guys are great. Yeah. They went from sleeping on the floor in our apartment to we each get a car? <laughs> we're, forget the rest of the investment. Look, we, we, we think America is the greatest country <laughs> in the world. <laughs> you still remember the moment you guys sold the company for, what was it, $307 million? Yeah, it was, um, You're in your mid 20s? Yeah, I was 20. I was 26, 2027, 20, so right, right around that time. And, and you get a 15, 20 million dollar payout. Yeah, exactly. Or it was, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was surreal. You know, the, the, the challenge with startups, and I think anyone in a startup can really relate to this, is the highs are amazing, and the, but the lows are harsh. And you, 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 we were now four years in at that point building the company. And you just go from one day you're going to take over the world to the next day. Oh my God, we're just we're just done. And so we had a, a lot of people that were trying to buy us, and we um, we were also kind of beaten down. So we we're like, okay, how do we how do we make our way through this? So, so we ended up having this deal with AltaVista where they this is going to sound amazing. So they would not allow us to buy to buy stock. This is 1999. Things were nuts. Everything was up and to the right. So they they made us take cash, and we were we were great time to take. <laughs> I mean, we, we didn't know what anything <laughs> right. about timing, right? right? Six months later, Yahoo realized what was uh, was going on, and they acquired the combined entity. But our our status, our part of it was triple the price. So it was sold for almost a billion dollars, um, but in, in stock, right? And then six months later, it was worth almost zero because the bubble burst. <laughs> so it was this ride where we're like, we got this crazy experience of getting a wire of cash literally to our individual bank accounts, crazy money. And then, then feeling like, oh my goodness, we, we sold too early because look at how much it's worth. And then a year later going, ah, this is why they say cash is king. <laughs> It was, a, it was a hell of a learning experience. It's interesting you mentioned, uh, you know, the lows can get really low with a, a startup, but that made me think, why then consistently put all your chips back into the game? It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't call it an addiction. There's a, there's a love for doing something that, that it's kind of bringing something new to the world. There's a love for that. And something new that benefits the world, something new that makes the world a better place. It's just a real love for it. And all of the, all of the non-entrepreneurial stuff, I've just found that just doesn't do that for me. Every, co every big company starts small and every, small, every big company has gone through those highs and lows of do we deserve to exist? Uh, are, are all the naysayers right? And then the next day, oh wait a minute! I think this is working. People seem to like it. All right, okay. I know, I know, I'm back. You know, and and it's truly a, it's truly a day to day experience for me. And I don't really know what it's like to not do that. Whether it was your mom being a dietitian or the fact that your dad, when you were growing up and you would cook, would sit the family down together for yeah. meals. In what ways, if at all, do you think that influenced you professionally with food? 
Well, I would say cooking for me, cooking for my family, cooking for my friends, has frankly been a gift for me. You know, so I how so? I found it to be meditative. I found it to lower my anxiety. Um, I also play guitar. Anyone who has social anxiety will understand. You put something between you and the, and so, and your people around you, like a guitar or a kitchen uh, a kitchen island. Um, it actually manages my social anxiety a lot. So I, that part is really a gift for me. The gift is first and foremost a beautiful way for me to calm down at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day. I cook at minimum one meal a day. I try to cook two meals a day. I love cooking for my family. I absolutely love it. Um, but then the gift for my family or my friends is really beautiful. So if I cook, uh, I was uh, made breakfast this morning with my daughter. We sit down, we eat our our eggs together, and we we say that in the morning we will say what are we excited about today, and in the evening we say what are we grateful for today. And even if it's 15 minutes, it's the best part of the day. So you're in New York. You enrolled at. French Culinary Institute, which is now the International Culinary Center. What uh, about that made it so brutal? Oh yeah, I remember being screamed at by a chef who might be five foot four, five foot three even, French chef. And I'm six foot five, and the he's so close to me, and he's directing up at me, and the spittle is landing on my face, and I'm just taking it. And I just, I was, I kind of had this out-of-body experience. It's like, uh, I'd already gone through the phases of, does he know who I am? You know, I'm, I've already been a very successful entrepreneur at that point, and like, that doesn't help at all. So the, yeah. that kind of thing. So I just accepted the fact that, that they were here to break me down and, and build me up again. And I just had this out-of-body experience of, I just can't believe that this is how they teach people. In fact, when I would talk to the, the senior chefs about it, the, the, the head of the school, They'd be like, oh, no, no, he's really nice. He likes you a lot. <laughs> and, I, and they do this in the Army, too. Uh, it's a way to break down your ego so that they can then really start you over. And when you leave the school, you are in their mold. And I'm not good at that. It's the same price as Harvard. <laughs> it's like 50 grand to go to okay. the school per year. And um, it was an 18-month program. And uh, starts with 25 people. You don't get your money back. Six people graduated. And this was August of 2001. 2001. And the 9-11 terrorist yeah. attacks. How did you find out your mom volunteered your services? Oh, so 9-11, so, uh, so I, grew, I, I, I lived at Chambers and Broadway. Um, woke up to the sounds of the plane hitting the building. And uh, we're running up the, you know, we're trying to escape. Yeah. The whole thing. We, we get to Canal Street. We see this big white cloud coming, and people were coming out of it in cars, holding on to cars. It was like the car, car would be packed, and just people holding onto the sides of cars, getting out of the dust cloud, covered in white dust, and just uh, you just can't. I just I'm just so glad we we were half a block from it. So if we had been in that block, we would have been in that dust cloud. We would have been permanently damaged, I think. So what we saw was chaos and that's white, white dust cloud. But the second one falling we saw from Union Square. So we had direct line of sight, see only one of them, and we saw it fall down. And that was just like reality breaking. It was just not possible. How is, how is, this, how is this possible? And so my mom's apartment was on 22nd Street, just above Union Square. <clears throat> And we were, we were there with maybe eight or nine other people just sleeping on the floor for uh, at least two weeks, I think. She got called to be a volunteer, and so we were in the apartment when she got called. And she was, she was great. You know, my mom's the best. She's our best uh, cheerleader. And she said, look, I really appreciate the call. I'm a dietitian. I'm not a cook. But my son just graduated from cooking school. And he has a diploma and everything. And if you if you need a volunteer, he's available. So they said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll give him a try. And I went down. I was just peeling potatoes for 16 hours a day for a couple of weeks, and then worked my way up to you know do the pasta station and worked my way up to the saute station. By the end of it, I was because it was six weeks long. 
and it was every day and it was the I think the best way to deal with the trauma because everyone else was freaking out and I had stuff to do you know it was really great beautiful experience and I even even drove I got to a point where I was allowed to drive the ATVs you know with all the radios and all thing and uh, we would take this beautiful food put a on the back of, a tr of an ATV, and I would drive in the dark with a flashlights and everything, and we'd go to this gymnasium that had been reconfigured to serve the firefighters, take the food out of the cooler, beautiful food cooked by the best chefs in the world. We'd see these firefighters come in to the gymnasium. They'd have these big shells on, and they would take these dusty shells off, and they would just have this, like, this gray look in their face, and I still, I'll never forget it. And we would f do our best, you know, give them the best food we can, put our love into every dish. And they would just sit across from each other. They wouldn't talk. And then they would eat a bit. And then you feel the life come back into the room. And then by the end of like 45 minutes is what they had over the break, they would have their life back in there. And then we talked back to each other. And I just could feel the, the, the sense of community that these guys had. And they would put their shells back on. And they would go right back out into those piles of metal to save American lives. And I was I love this. This is the most beautiful feeling. So I was like, that's kind of when I said, I'm, I'm going to go to a restaurant. It, it's nothing like the tech companies. It didn't even make rational sense. It just was an emotional connection that I had to it. And uh, that led me to, to do a restaurant. So I want to take you to Jackson Hole. Uh, oh, Valentine's yeah. Day, 2010. You hop on an inner tube just to have the same kind of fun your uh, kids were having. Uh, take it from there. I'm an advanced snowboarder, and the day before, I'm doing all this pretty advanced snowboarding, and I'm going down a cliff in Jackson Hole Mountain. And I say to myself, well, I remember saying this to myself, Kimball, you got kids. This is not smart. You need to chill out and look after yourself a bit more. So I finish the day, go, go home. Valentine's Day the next day, let's go inner tubing on a children's run on Jackson Hole Mountain, uh, what could go wrong? <laughs> so I uh, get on the inner tube, my kids are going down and having a blast, they're like four and six years old, and I get on it, I'm six foot five, and it's the same tube that, all, that everyone uses, so that should have been a red flag, I, was like, I, I should not do it, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm usually a yes guy, you know, when it comes to risk. So the tube goes down, I get about 35 miles an hour. I hit these braking mats at the bottom, and uh, I was, my head was facing downhill at the time, and so the, just the center of gravity was forward, and so instead of the mats breaking the, the tube, it just stopped the tube, and it just launched me off the tube, going flying backwards, and I, hit, I land on my head into, but the force of the, of the landing pushes my head into my chest. I have concussion in my chest from my head going into my chest, ruptures my spine at C6 and C7, I'm paralyzed uh, from the neck down. And I am in this medical clinic in Jackson Hole and I'm just like, I just can't believe like what, what I, I don't have any pain, right? There's no pain with paralysis, it's just nothing. And I remember this doctor saying, we think we can fix you, we're gonna fly in some surgeons to, to work on your, on your neck. And I'm like, oh yeah, things are gonna be fine. And then I realize I've got tears streaming down the side of my face and I, I have no idea what is going on, just no idea. Because if it doesn't work out, you're a quadriplegic. quadriplegic. I was paralyzed on my left, so I still had some movement in my right. But the way, it's, the way it was working was blood was going into the spinal column, so it was getting worse. It was three days before they could get the right amount of surgeons in. Because you can't fly me out either, because the blood would expand and then I would have permanent paralysis. And so every few hours they'd do another MRI with me and uh, they'd just, they'd run around with their hair on fire about oh, this or this or that. And, um, uh, I, um, I just remember watching them do it and just have this kind of surreal out of body experience of, I remember my brother was there, Antonio was there and uh, I actually, I, this is a, uh, I don't know if we say this out loud, but it's like I actually had a, my first experience with God 
Really? Yeah, yeah I, I'm not a religious person. I'm not, uh, in fact, if anything, I'm against religion. I think it's done more damage for the world than anything. And I had God speak to me. And it was uh, this beautiful, um, clear message. It was, I was working on an internet company doing real-time search, which is kind of a cool startup, but it was, it was um, I was not happy uh, doing it. And then I was not happy in my marriage. And uh, the voice said, if they fix you, you're gonna work on kids and food. And I was like, that is out of left field, man. <laughs> I do work at the time in the restaurants. I, I did support philanthropically some kids uh, help, helping some nonprofits work on food. But like, what? I'm gonna work on kids and food? And it was this beautiful, soft, clear message. If they fix you, you're gonna work on kids and food. Uh, and it also actually said I would get a divorce. And I was like, okay. So I, three days later, I come out of this uh, surgery and it is a success. Did you think it was gonna be a success? They kept telling me that. Okay. Um, but no, I, I really didn't, no. I just, uh, I was just complete shock. Anyway, so I, I come out of the surgery and um, all of a sudden I can move my fingers and uh, one of the first things I do is I ask for a laptop and I resign from my company. And then I told my wife that I want to work with kids and food. And so her name is Jane Lewin and she's an amazing, amazing designer and helped design the restaurants, but also uh, other things. And I said, like, can you help me design these, this, this new way of connecting kids to food through school gardens? We designed it together and um, it was a few months later I said, you know, I think we, all, we also need to be divorced. But, but that, that is another story. But the fast forward, what, 12, 13, 13, 14 years later, um, we're now a funder of 150 nonprofits around the country. We provide equipment, those same learning garden beds that Jen designed, we are now all over the country. We're in thousands of schools. We literally changed how kids are taught about food in a 10 year period. We were serving as an example for, for other, other school districts and other schools to actually invest in a proper outdoor classroom, growing food tied to the curriculum. And I was like, wow. Since you alluded to it, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think you learned about yourself going through your first marriage and then divorce? Uh, yeah, I am very grateful for my first marriage. I, I love Jen to this day. She's wonderful. I'm very proud of myself for, for choosing a partner for the mom of, my, of two of my kids. What I learned was there's, uh, there's a difference between love and compatibility. And uh, for a while we were compatible and we, we, we really had a, a life together and, and I think we, we were facing this sort of seven year itch. We ended up staying together much longer than that, but where, like, oh, we really have to decide that we're on the same journey together or, 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 or separate. And I think it was that sort of denial that, oh no, this is fine, we can keep doing it the way it was. So I guess one of the most powerful learnings was life is long. I have this, uh, this attitude now, which I did not have at the time is, I look back at life in decades rather than uh, life is just one life. Like one of the decades I remember is 2008 to 2018, you know, that, that sort of bookend. And I remember that, I was like, yeah, that, that, was, that, was, a, that was a doozy. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I got divorced in that time, I broke my neck in that time, and we had to figure out the Tesla in that time, we had to figure out space, we had to do the restaurants, we had to do the nonprofit, and it was like, wow, that was hard. That was a particularly hard decade. And let's try not to have it, this, one, this next one be that hard. I, one of my great lessons of, of that was, if you're gonna be with someone, uh, it's okay to acknowledge that you're gonna have different chapters and sometimes you, you aren't really the, a fit for the next chapter, and it's, it's okay. You have uh, four kids, four uh, kids. three biological, one step yeah. child. Uh, the role they play in your lives is oh yeah. So I love my kids. So we, as I said, we, I cook for them all the time. Yeah. I connect a lot, of, a lot through my meals with them. I love, love cooking with them. We just did a Thanksgiving where it was just the six of us, and we all just took turns cooking something. And they, they have taken to cooking, and I love it. Um, none of them is professionals. I don't think anyone is has that in, uh, ambition, but. But we, we love connecting through food. What are your hopes for them? I, I have this parenting attitude of, I want them to be good people. I want them to be happy. 
I want them. Look, they don't need to be. I want them because I'm their, their loving father. But um, other than that, I, I, I'm more curious about their journey. You've been called the farm to table pioneer. What do you think you recognized a little earlier on than most? I got to give credit to Hugo, my, my co-founder, Hugo Matheson. Who he, you were once the line chef. Yeah, I was his line chef. I was yeah. his line cook in Boulder. So right. he worked at the River Cafe in London. And to be fair to the farm to table movement, it really started in the 70s. Uh, it started with uh, the River Cafe in London, Chez Panisse in, in California, and a few other restaurants uh, in USA and Europe. And, uh, but it didn't really take off. Um, and what happened in 2004 was this, first of all, you got Hugo who says, we gotta work with local farmers. That's gonna make all the difference in the quality of our food. Uh, we had this completely naive vision that we wanna cook four nights a week, 40 people a night, would we'll change the menu every day. And you know, it was like this beautiful vision. But within three months, we were literally serving 3,000 people a week. We were open seven days a week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we're like, what have we gotten ourselves into? But it, was, it, was, it really hit a nerve. Farm to table became a thing. Um, but I think one of the reasons why it took off, whereas it didn't take off in the 70s, was the internet started to happen. So what, what I noticed back in 2004, as crazy as it sounds, is almost no one was in, on email. It was bizarre. Like, uh, I I'd already built and sold an area company, and it was now five years later, and I'm talking to farmers that still use phone and paper chits, and I was like, come on, like, if you can just email us your order, we, you, we don't have to worry about us picking, the, picking up the phone, we can respond. Texting wasn't a thing back then, so uh, email was, was the tool, and all of a sudden, our farmers went from having this complete disconnect between us and the restaurant to having a constant flow of communication. And, and this happened all around the same time that these farmers could now tell us what they were growing, what they actually were harvesting, because that actually changed on a daily basis. And um, we had this thing with, you can deliver really anything by four in the morning, but if you can email us, we'll be able to plan the menu and we we'll actually get your, because the other thing about farm to table, you want it to be fresh. So you, the last thing you want to do is get a delivery and then put it on the menu three days later. Right. You want to do it that day. And all of a sudden, the farm-to-table movement could, it could exist. I've, I've always been amazed at the synchronicity of things. But it also takes like the sort of entrepreneurial mindset. Of like, no, I, I think this, we've got to be able to solve this. seems silly. And, in, and that was certainly silly. Like we're, email has existed for a long time. In my, it had existed my entire life. Yeah. Like, and these people had never heard of it. And I was like, okay, we can, we can fix it with email. And nowadays, of course, everyone's much more sophisticated than that. And it's great. We get to the best product from the best farmers, and we can move, we can move things around like supply chain, and that just wasn't a thing 20 years ago. How do you view the processing of foods? Uh, I'm not a fan of processed food. I think that uh, there are many ways to feed people, and I do believe in feeding people. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. People go hungry, and we need to figure that out. But one of the things I've worked on is, how do you get people to, to cook again? But I love cooking. It's not just like, it's work, we must make them cook. No, no, actually cooking is great. It's this beautiful feeling of cooking for yourself. Like I said, it's a gift for myself to just take some time to meditate, if it's re relaxing. But it's also a gift to your family and your friends. And I was like, okay, how can I solve for the problem, which is making sure people can afford it, making sure people can eat and enjoy the flavor of it, so I do believe that processed food solves this problem in many ways by making it so that nothing goes off. That, okay, it's relatively cheap to do, go to McDonald's. It's not actually that cheap though. If you, you do a family of four, you go to McDonald's, it's $30, $35, it's not, it's not that cheap. And so what I, uh, one of the ways I, I was tackling it was I worked with um, uh, some friends of mine who owned all these billboards around the country and, I put it like billboards up of how to roast a chicken, 400 degrees, one hour, salt and pepper, $6. And a beautiful picture of a roast chicken. And so that went across the whole country. And then um, broccoli, a little bit of salt, olive oil, 350, one hour, done. Uh, $2. And then, and so it would be the price plus very the simplest recipes ever carrots, salt, uh, 400 degrees, one hour, $2. And so for $10, because these, these billboards would be kind of near each other, you could feed a family of four using food you get from the grocery store, you can get in any grocery store, not like Whole Foods or whatever. And um, 
I think that there are better ways to solve the problem than processed food. But I also want to be thoughtful that there's a lot of people still have to kind of get into cooking. Explain the thinking uh, with square roots behind cultivating three acres of plants in this eight foot by 40 foot storage container. Actually, it's more than that. So, so square roots is a, um, what's what we call farming as a service, where we, we, we grow food locally if people desire, or we might do for or research and development. And um, uh, we, we, we have this incre incredibly cool group of young entrepreneurs that work with us. Well, I wouldn't call them entrepreneurs. They're more like technology farmers, you know, like, but so this entrepreneurial in a sense where they want to work in farming, but they also want to have high school jobs. And we, we work with uh, amazing, you know, governments or foundations or major food, food uh, suppliers, and we'll grow food for them. Sometimes we'll grow basil or we'll grow arugula, but sometimes we, we grow things that are technically very difficult. So it's more truly on the cutting edge of science of like, without using a GMO or anything like that, but it's like, okay, how do we grow using less light? How do we grow this particular crop with um, uh, different techniques so, so that if it works, we can then scale it out yep. to the world. But back to your point around how many acres, our farm in Michigan, which is um, 10 zones, 10, 10 shipping containers, if we just grew basil, grows more basil than the equivalent of 500 acres of land in Michigan. Wow. Like, like go from, and this is less than an acre. Yeah. Expand, it will grow more food than 500 acres. It's so, it's so incredible what, what's possible. And, and how do you do it? It's all vertical. Yeah. But it's also, you, you do it through plant science. So you, a typical grow season for basil in Michigan is once a year, 70 days. We actually replicate the climate of Genoa, Italy. So we actually, the best season of Genoa, June of 1997, because it's like that's when the moisture was right, the flavor was better. So we're going to replicate that and refine it and refine it, and so we can get it down to a 28-day growth cycle. So you're able to grow the basil in a quicker amount of time. It tastes better. It is better, and you get 13 seasons instead of one. So then, so you and then you grow it vertically, and it, yeah, do the maths. One acre goes to 500 acres. And look, obviously, innovation's hard. You know, way better than me on the square roots front. There were, you know, staff layoffs and location sure, yeah, no, things, of course. Uh, this past summer. Um, what have you found to be the biggest challenges with making it a success? Yeah, I mean, you know, Square Roots is a is a great company, and you know, I've, I've gone through ups and downs with all companies. And, right. and last year was a was sort of a reckoning in the whole indoor farming industry which was, it had a lot to do with the capital markets. So the capital markets said, you know, the Fed said, we're gonna make it more expensive to, to get money. Uh, they raised rates, rates yeah. very quickly. Right. And the, the, the challenge with indoor farming is it requires a lot of capital to, to invest. And so it was just a very, very loud signal from, from the capital markets to say, if you're thinking of growing, or building more factories or more, in our case, small plant farms, it's going to be a lot more expensive. I am always amazed at how hard these decisions are. We're obviously affecting people's jobs, but also we have this vision of getting real food to everyone. We, we, we really wanted to be on that path. And, um, and uh, it's, really, it's really humbling to have to make those kind of hard decisions. And now I look back and I'm like, well, the, the right decision, the company's doing, doing well. What do you think has to happen long-term to make it a success? Well, I think in our case, at Square Roots, we are focused on solving very difficult technical problems. Like if we're just growing basil, eh, we're feeding rich people in, in America. Eh, not, not that exciting. Okay, but we're trying to figure out how to grow food. It might be lettuces or it might be might be tomatoes or something, but we're trying to do it with 1 20th of the light, and that uses 1 20th of the energy. Oh, that's a game changer. So I get excited about that. And then on the, that sort of directional path, we're helping the world figure out how to grow indoors. We will have to, unfortunately, because of climate change, have to grow indoors a lot in the future. Not, not everywhere, but a lot. And in some, some, in some parts of the world, maybe it might be most of their, their product, and if they, or most of their food, and if they have to use that much energy, we, we, run, out of, we run out of energy. So it was really, you know, if you, if you kind of do the math, we have to solve this problem. So I'm, I'm quite excited for Square Roots to play a role in there. On the Tesla front, um, as I understand it, 
the target cost of the Roadster was originally supposed to be $50,000. It ends up ballooning to $140,000. Um, take me to that moment and what you recall. Yeah, so, so we had this idea, which was the right idea, but man, it was harder than we thought, was to, instead of thinking about an electric car as, a, as an entry-level car, cheap car, drive 35 miles, basically like a Toyota Camry, but, but worse, um, the, the way an electric motor, motor works is it's, it's, it's constant torque. If you put it in the right a car, like a Ferrari, for example, um, you will get better performance than the Ferrari engine. It'll, it'll, it'll launch like a rocket. And um, we, uh, we had this idea to take a Lotus Elise, which is a car that was already being made, sold for $40,000, put an electric motor in it, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't need the engine, so we thought, oh, that should be about 50K or so, and we should be able to sell it for that. We ended up having to sell them for $140,000, which is really like a go-kart. Like it was a cool go-kart, but it was yeah. a go-kart. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm six foot five, and I remember for four years, I made it my daily driver. You still have it? I, I still have it. And um, I would get in and out of that car. It felt like it was like a giraffe getting out of a cocoon. I mean, <laughs> it was just so silly, but it did work. And I made it a point because I was selling cars, and I was proudly maybe sold more cars than my brother. Man, like my brother, my brother probably sold more cars than me, but I have sold a lot of cars. And we knew we needed to prove it. What I think was so great about the Roadster is it did actually prove it. It proved that if you took the price out of the picture, it was an amazing car. I mean, you, there was not a car in the world that performed better than that Roadster. You show up in that car to the coolest party in LA, you get bumped to the front of the line, they put your car right up front. It was a stunning car. I mean, the design of it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, we're very proud of taking it very seriously that even though the price, we could not control that, with this was this was a great car. And, and uh, so we did succeed at that. We had to sell 2,500 of them. Each one of them took hours to sell. And it was, wasn't just me and my brother, every, every, all hands on deck just to, just to get them sold so that we could earn the right to do the Model S, right? And so we, we, did, we did get it done um, all the way down to the last one. I think we even lost money on every car, but we proved the point. We proved the point that people want the car, they, that EVs are better, and uh, that enabled us to get the financing for Model S. One of the... Uh toughest, presumably, periods of your business career was leading into the Great Recession. You guys are basically out of money. Uh, SpaceX has had three failed launches, Tesla's so uh, ble bleeding dollars. You have, I, I, I don't know if it's a million bucks or, I've read one story where it's a million bucks, in other words, like 375,000 more like Apple the 375,000. Yeah. That was what I had left after, after, I sold my company 10 years before that, but I had put money into Tesla and others, other companies and SpaceX and others, and, I had nothing left. This is how bad 2008 was, people don't remember. I, I have a bank here called Colorado Capital and I had also decided to buy a house and keep my old house, which sounded good at the time, but then 2008 happened and everything fell to pieces. And I get a call from the bank saying, hey, uh, you are missing your mortgage payments. You're gonna, we're gonna need to, need to either force you to bankruptcy or, um, or uh, take the houses or something like that. And so I'm having those calls happening. And then, I, they, but they knew that I had some assets and including $375,000, I had an Apple stock, which I loved Apple. And my brother called me and said, uh, I just need your help, need whatever you got. And what's great about America is bankruptcy is not totally the worst thing in the world. Like you, okay, if I go through bankruptcy, uh, I'll figure it out. I feel like I'm a capable human. But if I don't help Tesla, I'll regret it forever. And, I, and I, I wanted to help my brother, but it's also my company. I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted it to be successful. So I actually made that decision. I remember selling the stock, wiring it to, my, to, to Tesla right away. And I, me, immediately I get a call from my bank because they are watching my stock transactions. And they're freaking out. Like they're gonna, they were so pissed, they're gonna force me into bankruptcy because that was kind of their, their safety buffer that I was gonna pay my mortgage. And I was like, sorry, I, that's all I got. I, 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 trust me, I will get, I will work my way through this. I will, like, we are in relationship here. Uh, let's, let me figure it out. Don't, don't take my houses from me. And I'd get a call every week. We're gonna fight, we're gonna fight you into bankruptcy. Da, da, da. 
And then all of a sudden I stopped getting calls and I'm like, okay, well, I'll just, I'm sure they're gonna call me at some point. And then a month later, I get a call from the same guy and he says, we just wanna let you know that our bank just went bankrupt. Mm. And I was like, oh, it's that bad. Everything just fell to pieces. And I, I was saved, because it took them about a year. They even told me this, they said, another bank will buy the debt, you've got about a year. And within a year, I was able to figure things out and uh, be able to pay back those loans. And whoa, that was hard. What was your lowest point during that period? I mean, it was constant, it was constant fear and anxiety to, to lose it all. I mean, we were, we had to close it, we had to close the financing with Tesla, um, which was super hard. I mean, General Motors went bankrupt, Chrysler went bankrupt, Ford was about to go bankrupt. Now all of a sudden the car startup is going to get funded? Like, no way. And that's our good friend Antonio Gracias actually stepped in and did a career risking event, uh, decision to, to fund, lead the round. And so we, we, when we pulled that round together, SpaceX got a, a deal from NASA right around Christmas. We actually did get a rocket into orbit. orbit. So that kind of got that company through there. I had my own, my restaurant was going through its own crisis because of the Great Recession. You're getting hit from everywhere. Getting hit from everywhere. And um, yeah, so you just take it one day at a time. And I've gone through that many times since then where we had 2018, where Tesla almost went bankrupt three or four times. And just take it one step at a time. Make one, just one you know, don't, don't think about tomorrow, just think about today. Why was that 2018 period arguably harder? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's harder. Okay. I would say that it was the other very hard year. Uh, both were very hard. Uh, so 2018, we had to get the Model 3 launched. We had to build thousands and thousands of cars, tens of thousands of cars, maybe even hundreds. I can't remember the exact number, but it was like a lot of cars. Uh, 5,000 a week was basically our goal, and they just started so, sort of stacking up. And then we had all these naysayers that were doing drone footage of the of the parking lots of cars. How on earth are we gonna get these cars out to customers? And we had September 30th to hit, and I'd taken over logistics where, where uh, I'm not, I don't normally operate in the company, but I, from like July to September that year, I came in and worked in the offices and would, would, would fly to distribution centers to say like, what's going on? Why is this, this one not working? There was one, there was one happening in, in Georgia where our cars were stuck in this truck stop in Georgia, <laughs> and and everyone was like coming up with excuses like this, that, that. And I was like, no, no, none of these excuses make sense. I want to talk to the the guy in charge of the truck, and I called him, and it, this is crazy. He was going through a divorce, and he was sad, and he had parked all of his trucks in this truck stop, and didn't want to work that night because he was sad. You don't just in charge of one truck; you're in charge of this, this fleet of semis, and we need—we really need it. If you don't—if you don't mind, I, would, I, I, I really understand the pain you're going through. I've been through divorce. Um, can you can you do this for me? And he said, "Okay." And at midnight, that entire fleet of trucks started moving again, and like it was like that level of humanity that we were—we went all the way down to the people driving. And then later later on in the month, I was in New York. And we had, I think we had like 10,000 cars we had to deliver in the New York area. You just physically couldn't do it. And so we had this idea to reach out to our fan base and ask them if they would deliver the cars for us. And we just had thousands of people come out of the woodwork. We just had to trust them because if they wanted to, it's their car. They've got the paperwork, it's theirs. And it was so beautiful to ask for help to get help in spades and um, uh, do something that was completely nonsensical. It was just, it was incredible. How satisfying was that to go through it and then I will say come the most the other end? satisfying moment of that whole time was, um, I think if I recall correctly, the last day of September was a Sunday. So it was a lot of cars, you know, you can't deliver cars on a Sunday in many states. And it was Saturday night, so it really mattered what we did on Saturday night. And I was up till like one or two in the morning, and I was just like pushing every single person in the you know one direct emails, direct texts, direct calls to every single person I could 
to get that number above, I think, the, I think it was like, we need to go above 80,000, I think we got to 81,000. I still remember that, it was such a beautiful feeling of like, wow, I actually didn't think we were gonna get this done. I actually did not think this would happen. I, I, I had, sh in my own mind, had shorted myself, like, there's no way. And, and the same with everybody, or do you think you were the exception? I think, I think even my brother was like, yeah, there's no way. There's just no way. And, uh, but if you go into it with there's no way, and you're like, well, let it go. Like, okay, what do we got to lose? Let's go for it. Um, and again, it was like, I couldn't go to sleep for hours. So just, just remember just being in the house and just kind of feeling the silence of the beautiful Colorado night. Just, just, we did it. It was amazing. We were talking a little earlier about SpaceX, and I'm curious the the uh, first conversation you remember having where it was about, hey, we might build a rocket company here. I was in a conference room. My brother asked me to join, and it was more like a nonprofit venture. I don't think we used the words nonprofit because we didn't really know what that meant at the time, but it was a philanthropic venture for sure to to take a potted plant, just like in a little ceramic jar with, with leaves on it, and get it to Mars. Just to prove that it can be done. Not, not, not like build a business or anything like that. And, uh, and then that turned into, well, maybe the best way to do this is as a for-profit. And, and I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm gonna invest because I'd love to support my brother, but also it's kind of cool to go watch rockets launch and blow up and stuff. And so that all kind of worked out pretty well. <laughs> You were talking earlier about the price structure and then the alternative SpaceX ended up coming around and offering with cost plus. Well, uh, well, sorry, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the alternative to exactly. cost plus. That, yeah, yeah so, so the military industrial complex, the reason why it is so, uh, why it has such a bad reputation is um, the government wants control and the for-profit companies want cash flow. So they're like, okay, let's all come up with an idea. Well, why don't we just do cost plus? Whatever it costs you, we will give you 10% above that as your cash flow. So the natural out of, uh, outcome of that is for Boeing and Lockheed to say, turns out it costs us a lot, like a lot. Oh, we're gonna, oh, we need 50,000 people for this launch. And it takes forever. And it takes forever, right. because the longer it takes, the more money they make. And so that, of course, wasn't the intention, but that's just how human nature works. And so SpaceX came along and said, look, we're doing the math on this. This thing's not gonna cost that much. It's not gonna cost a billion dollars. It's gonna cost $50 million. And uh, the government would say, but we'll pay you a billion. We just want you to do it our way. No, but that's the wrong way. You have to, you should do it this way. It's, it's 50 million. We were very happy with that price. The government was like, no, but we don't want that. And we actually couldn't believe it. We're like, but you must want it for a lower price. Actually, they didn't care that much about price. The, the, especially the generals, the generals and the, the military, they really didn't care about price because they really needed it. They, I was one conversation with the general, it was very enlightening. He was like, I need you to understand, I am a general, I am in charge of success in war. I need it to be the way I need it to be. You need to understand where I'm coming from. I need to control this. And, uh, I, it was enlightening because it's not untrue that if you're a general, you don't want to lose control, but it had gone, gotten so out of hand. In fact, it was Senator McCain who fought for us in government to allow the government to do a different business model. So we have a lot of respect for him and we spent good time with him. Um, but without someone like him, like a maverick inside a government to say, hey, there's a different way here, we would still be in this world where you cough in the direction of, of space and it's you know, $10 billion as opposed to a SpaceX, we're able to do a launch now twice a week. And it's all, cost, so it's, it's all you, we, we charge you a price and you pay that price and we deliver. Just like it, as if we're Amazon. And, and that's how we ended up, you know, I think we now run 80% of the, of the launch business in the country. I wanna take you to uh, September 28th, 2008. Tell about Disneyland that morning and oh, then yeah. everything you remember from the fourth launch that followed. Well, the, so remember we had three failed launches. They're all in Kwajalein. So Kwajalein is in the mid-Pacific. It's a military base. And that's the only place where we were allowed to launch rockets because we couldn't hurt people. And they were right, because we blew up the first three. 
Um, <clears throat> so at this point, we had no capital left. 2008 was a disaster for all around. It wasn't just SpaceX. And there wasn't also much to do. So we didn't fly to Quaj. We, 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 we were in LA. The control room is actually is in LA. So control room is, is this sort of uh, uh, mobile home in a parking lot. <laughs> so it's like literally as, as uh, cheap as you can imagine. So the, rather than stay in the, in the control room, my brother and I went to Disneyland with our kids. And we had, we had the best day because you're standing in line, we didn't have any VIP passes, and you're just kind of like, you're just letting the day pass, like it's a way, it's a way to use up the day. And uh, we, had, uh, we had a great time. And we're like, we checked our watches. You know, the launch is at 4. I remember it being at 4 o'clock. And it was like 2.30. So we should, we should probably get back. It wasn't like, let's get back with much time to spare. So what, what actually turned out is we got there maybe a few minutes before the launch. So we almost missed it. But it was kind of the right, it was just, we were just kind of in the flow. We get there and the launch goes off successfully. And it, it wasn't like a celebration. It just, everyone just started crying. It was just this emotional release of years of working and um, people hugging each other. Uh, it, was, it wasn't like a celebration experience. It was like a, an emotional uh, uh, release. It was just, it was, it was beautiful. And then I started t tearing up and crying as well because just, just the energy in the room is so, so emotional. Um, what we had done had never been done before. Uh, launched a private, a private company launched into, into, or, into orbit, and it was the last shot we had before we'd be out of business. And it was done by a team of 500. Boeing's comparable division has 50,000. I mean, this was truly a startup, uh, and startups don't, don't do these things. Startups work on internet apps, so they work on whatever, you know, like kind of normal things. This is a government, this is what governments do. And then you get a $1.6 billion NASA contract a couple days before Christmas. Uh, yeah, it was, the, it was NASA saying, okay, you deserve to live. How amazed have you found it, how quickly the influence that Starlink and that technology is commanded? Well, first of all, technology is amazing. And I never doubted that it would be it would be an incredible benefit to the world. I mean, more internet is just a desire. It is, it, it is, even no matter how fast your internet is, no matter how good it is, no one will say, I, I'm okay, I'll have less internet. Like it's, just, it's just not a thing. Yeah. Um, so I really believed it would, it would help the third world the most because they could leap over fiber and so forth. Then you'd have the second world and rural communities that would help a lot. I actually didn't realize how much it would affect global politics. And that, that I think was, a, was, was, you know, with the Ukraine war and so forth was, uh, I'm pro-Ukraine and a supporter of, of that resistance. And to give context to this, and I got this from Walter's book, I mean, you have the, the head of the Ukraine military texting you guys. Yeah, you know, there's, a story requesting that's actually, help. there's a story that's yeah. not in the book that um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share here. So I get a call from a, Canadian, a member of the Canadian government that uh, says, I, they have a direct contact with the mayor of Kiev. This is, this is before Starlink had got, done anything. And uh, they, they, they would love some Starlinks. So ch check in with my brother and, and SpaceX, like, can we get them some Starlinks? And the general consensus is, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Biden government wouldn't, would be too hard to work with. And um, so we're like, oh, that sounds just like a drag. And you know, they just don't like my brother, and it's so, it's so depressing. But anyway, so, so the, the government in Canada said, you, what if we are your partner. And so we said, okay, we'll so trust you. We'll send you the, the Starlink. So we, we shipped it to Canada. I found out the story later, but they, they had to ship it to Germany. And then they had to smuggle it across the Ukraine border because you know, it's war, right? So, so, um, and we, it gets all the way to the mayor's, uh, the mayor's, the mayor is this boxer. Like he's this pretty really tough, tough looking guy. He has a twin brother. The clutch and, goes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I get this text on my phone from from the mayor. I, I didn't even know this guy, but they must have shared my number. And it's him and his brother pointing at the Starlinks in a in a truck 
that we had gotten to them and we got to them just in time because then they could use it to defend Kiev. So yeah, it was, it was quite a beautiful, um, I mean, to be part of that, it's like, I live an interesting life. Because cool. if not for that access to internet. Oh, they would have been, they would have been toast. There's no way. Uh, because Russia was able to block off all other communications and communications is, is everything in war. And even parts of the US military could not figure out how to unjam the, yeah. the access, but Starlink or SpaceX. Starlink is a distributed right. system, so you, you, it, it's really not a thing. You can't jam it. Because it's, it's, it's just settling. It's just, there's, flying over Kiev, there might be 25, and they're all, it's, it's, anything is possible, but it's very hard. Um, and uh, just to make sure that close on the Biden stuff, on, at the end, they did actually come around, and they are supporting Starlink, and thank you, uh, the Biden government, but it's, really was uh, and continues to be a, a frustrating relationship. By the way, the craziest thing in that whole story was uh, you guys had a almost yep. $150 million offer to supply the Starlink, but because of social media. Uh, I, I, no, I genuinely think, they, they, like, I genuinely gosh, think yeah. they would prefer my brother fail than help Ukraine. I mean, I genuinely think it's like to that level of emotional weirdness. Why but do you think that is? There's a genuine bitterness around success uh, in America today, which is really obviously not the reason I came to America. And, um, and I mean, it not, not from the average American. I think the average American is very excited for, for, for success. I mean it more from these sort of politicians. I'm a Democrat and, and I'm honestly really saddened and disappointed by the Democratic side where they've just been taken over by this, by this bitterness. Uh, and so they'd rather, uh, cut their nose to spite their face, like they'd rather hurt an American entrepreneur than succeed in the Ukraine war. I mean, it's like really like, really guys, really? We have to sneak this through Canada and Germany to get it in because you guys won't work with us? Like, really? I think there's a path out of it. But um, we, we, are, we are really seeing it firsthand, this, uh, this uh, dysfunctional relationship with, with success and, and creating value that, that I think uh, hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll get through it. And ambition and innovation needs well, to also, be celebrated. It's the American dream, right? Correct. To go and come to America and, and I love the American dream, I'm the American dream. I came with nothing and okay, I'm an immigrant, we have this immigration crisis and I, I feel for every American when it's like watching these immigrants coming across and, and at the end of the day, I also know what it takes to immigrate. It's really hard, it's a, it's a filter. Okay, so we're going to get some pretty good people if, 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 we, if we are able to figure out how to, how to bring them, uh, uh, merge them into our, into our country. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pro-immigration and, and so forth, but it's, um, it's the American dream. Like it's, it's like, it's only here, guys. It's great. We should, and we do, for the most part, we actually do celebrate it. But I think the people who are in charge right now don't. And that, 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 uh, I, I, again, I see a path out of it. I think it's we're I think we're getting through it. Take me through these rolling on the office floor fights that you guys used to have. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm very strong-willed person. My brother's a very strong-willed person, and we would just get into a fight over strategy for the business strategy, and we would just naturally get into. Well, of course, we should fight it out. <laughs> and didn't one one time we had to get a tetanus shot? Well, he was uh, he was holding his fist up, he was gonna punch me in the face. And I had no, I had no, um, no, I don't know if he actually would have punched me in the face, but I did, but I didn't know that. He was pretty, pretty fiery. And I had no defense. So the, the only defense I had was I grabbed his fist and I shoved it in my mouth and I tore a piece of skin off his fist. Yeah, so I had to go get a tetanus shot. The uh, <laughs> Asperger's he's spoken uh, so much about, the uh, positive and negative uh, impact, if that's what, in your mind? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that um, the positive is the genius side. The positive is absolutely, like it's just extraordinary what he is able to do. That, that he's, he's the greatest engineer in the world, and I think that, that's just, I don't even think anyone comes close, frankly. Um, I think the negative is, is it depends on, on your attitude, is, is just, he doesn't really have an empathy gene. You know, the sort of, uh, I'm very empathetic, and um, he has it in a unique way, but it... it and that means what? Um, just uh, social awareness would be one, but the other one is uh, empathy around 
you know, in, in, let's say work, like empathy around, well, you, you, you have a life, you have marriage. How is that relevant? Like, it's just, we have work to do. So there, there's, there's that part. But then there's all the way to just, you know, even with him and I, like, like I have to like speak out loud. This is how I am feeling. You know, that, that because of the Asperger's uh, side where like, I, if, I, if I say it out loud, then he can process what it is. But I can't expect him to feel it. And that, that, but I've grown up with him and we love each other and it, it works. I read a quote from uh, Peter Thiel, the famed investor entrepreneur. He said, uh, Elon wants risk for its own sake. And, you know, in terms of connectivity to you as well, in terms of always kind of throwing the chips back in the game. Yeah, I say as um, it relates to me, I, yeah. it's, it's hard for me to speak for Elon, but I, I would say for me, I love the energy of risk taking. It's sometimes really painful because you, you lose, you, you, get, you get it wrong quite often. I, I think that there's a, there's a love of, a love of making a difference. And I think that if you, in a very simplistic world, if you don't take risks, you're probably not making a difference. Like I, I don't mean that like people, people can do a lot of things that are not risky and make a difference. But I think that if you, if you think about it, like humanity's on this path. All right, I'm gonna try that path. Not that much of a difference. Actually, that's risk. And everyone on the path is gonna say, this is a bad idea, why are you doing that? You should be on our path. And, and I think I, I really love being, I've learned if you do that, you're probably wrong. People like my brother can do that. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not that good. I can go like here. And, and it's like, it fills me with, with passion and energy. And it's hard. Uh, and there's huge pain when you lose because losing is a thing. I mean, you get, you, you really get used to it and it's, uh, it's, it's okay because you learn. You said sometimes when the stress is so intense, you just won't notice anybody else in the room. How have you figured out the best way to manage that for you? Um, I meditate every day. So, uh, it's a way for me to kind of take at five at 5 PM, I'll take 20 to 30 minutes and I meditate. And I thought in the beginning, I was like, this is super hard. I'm bored, why am I here? And what I learned about meditation is just do it for a minute. Oh, you want to do it for two minutes? Do it for two minutes. And eventually I, it works out to be somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes for me. But, but um, so that really calms me down and it really matters to me because I want to be present for my family. So when I'm at work, I'm like, you know, doing my best to fire on all cylinders and then you come home and it's a very, it's quite a different thing. At home, you want to be connected to your kids and your family, my wife. And, um, and so I do take that that break, and that has enabled me to be really two different operating systems, an operating system during the day, and then an operating system at night. And what's the motivation professionally when you aren't in that survive or die mode anymore? Yeah, you know, one of the, I still run Big Green, which is our nonprofit, and there's no, we actually do well, we're, it's a well-funded nonprofit, and it's uh, quite successful, and I have to remind myself, why am I doing it, you know? Um, or why doesn't someone else do it? And, and I actually do love it. You know, I love helping this incredible BIPOC community of nonprofits that we work with and support. And I get to know them individually. I get to connect with them. We, we bring them together once a year in person and they teach each other. And I genuinely love it. You know, I genuinely love connecting with people. Um, so I think it's, it really is tapping into doing stuff you genuinely love. And in that particular case, while I do love my mission of kids and food, I love the community we're creating more than that. What do you want for the rest of your life? Ah, great question. I, uh, it's, if you, most, people, most people throw a 50th birthday party, I'm 51 now. I threw a halftime party. Because <laughs> oh. I'm about halfway through my life. You know, it's like, I think in my 90s, I'm probably gonna be doddering around like I was sort of ages one to 10. So what matters is your, your sort of life from say 20 to 50 and your life from 50 to 80. So I, I really did celebrate the fact that I'm only at half time. And- You've had some fun birthday parties here <laughs> yeah. from what I understand. I, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, good at, I'm good at having fun, that's, that's for sure. I, you know, when, you, when you're under so much stress, uh, I really had to learn to celebrate. It's a, it's a, one of my mentors taught me this is, even when things are super hard, if there's something to celebrate, celebrate it. 
And so I, I really do work hard at that. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so I, I look forward to the second half of my life and the second half is always more interesting than the first half, you know, in any sports game. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited for the future. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. <laughs>